Welcome back everyone to theCUBE's live coverage in Las Vegas with SaaS Explorer. I'm John Furrier, Dave Vellante, a CUBE host. We've got two great guests here, Brian Harris, who's the CTO of SaaS, and Reggie Townsend, Vice President of SaaS Data Ethics Practice. You got it. Gentlemen, thanks for coming on theCUBE. Really hey appreciate your time. Thank you for having us. Great keynote you just delivered this morning. Um, great tailwind AI gives you guys at SaaS. I mean, well-known mm -hmm. software practices, customer base is huge, a lot of practice in industry verticals. Yes. Well known. Yeah. Now, in comes the AI gift. <laughs> okay, you guys have to look at this and be like, this is right in your wheelhouse, skating to where the puck is going to go, it's right there for you. This is a, an interesting time. Share what it's like for you guys right now. What were some of the conversations? How did that play out for you guys? And, and share a little bit of the keynote we just heard. Well, I mean, it's important to note that for the last 25 years, SaaS has been deploying neural networks in production with customers. <laughs> So in some ways, like, we feel like, welcome to the party. We've been doing this for a long time and we're extremely proud of that, that history and, and really, frankly, um, the results we drive for, for businesses. We're, we're mission critical to so many businesses today. And so for us, seeing the market recognize the broader appreciation now of what AI can do, um, it's now about, for us, it's about just productivity and speed. So how do we make it as easy as possible for the broadest audience to take on AI integrate it into their businesses and do that at a price point that's cost effective so they can obviously either drive top line revenue or improve their margins or both. So for us it's just about how do we capture that momentum and translate that into our software to enable companies to become incredibly mature with AI. So when the AI herd around the world comes out, uh, how did that affect you, your customers, maybe not at all because you've been do doing it for yeah. a while, but Reggie I would imagine that it maybe changed the, the, the accelerated sort of the conversations. But I'd, I'd love to understand the before and the after. Yeah, 100%. So, you know, I like to say last November, uh, everybody learned how to spell AI, right? So that's- <laughs> It was invented. Right, right. Yeah. yeah, so that's, that's good. But to Brian's point, we've been yeah. in this space for quite some mm. time, uh, attempting to do it as best we can in a very responsible way, right? So we like to say, you know, we're about responsible innovation. Yep. Uh, yeah, some things seem like they're happening really quickly, but as Brian just alluded to, you know, a lot of what, we've, what we're talking about now has been around for a really long time. So now the question is, for us, you know, how do we, as you said, capture this moment, but at the same time, prove to the world that AI can be done in a responsible fashion, in an equitable fashion, in a way that you know, honors human agency and equity and all the rest of it. We think we're onto that. I like how you guys call that an AI life cycle. Mm -hmm. Kind of gives this feeling, it's not just a one and done. That's correct. Not a shiny new toy. But also in the keynote, what was, what was clear was that you guys had a practical view, but yet optimistic and enthusiastic about the realities of where it's going to go. That's what customers really want to hear. Yes. There's enthusiasm, the confidence has to be there. Yeah, and I think that you got to have a lot of capability to have confidence. So when we talk about, there's three things I often talk about our software is productivity, performance, and trust. Right, so if you're going to be productive, it's about efficiency, right? I use a phrase like, you know, right now the world is dealing with inflationary pressures. Well, the other I word that comes with inflation is inefficiency. And so the world is seeking out technology to drive out inefficiencies in their business to reduce the inflationary pressures. And so our software serves that purpose through AI and analytics, right? So the life cycle is about how do we enable companies to essentially learn as fast as they can against the data environment that they're actually analyzing. So if they can learn faster than their competitors and gain, gain insights out of the data faster than their competitors, then they're winning. They're going to have a competitive advantage, they're going to make better decisions earlier and faster. And then you can't, run, you can't go fast though without trusting what you're doing and that's yeah. why it's so important when we talk about trust. We heard end-to-end -end governance mentioned in the keynote, I think that was mentioned multiple times. And then also developer centric yeah. view on both sides of your yeah. new announcements. You had the workspace and yep. the app factory, which yep. seems to be a nice addition to a platform to abstract away the complexity of the data out there. Now, I want to dig into this because we've seen like everyone try to do data analytics for a decade. Yeah. The promise of big data and democratization has been there, but with foundation models where you don't have to recreate things. Yeah. You got different kinds of training and inference capabilities, really brings more productivity to say both platform and developers. This is a unique yeah. situation. You mind sharing your opinion on yeah, that? Yeah, so I think you got to look at it first that one of the big areas for us is that we work in industries and we focus on industries uh, that you know, we have to bring a very effective outcome in healthcare, in finance, 
in banking, right, in uh, manufacturing. So when you walk that back, right, it's about, all right, well, who are the people building this stuff? So you got to look at, there's developers and there's data scientists, right, and there's statistics, statisticians, right? If you look at the U.S. market, I think, if you look at the Census Bureau, it says there's about 500,000 data scientists who are statisticians out there. If you look at the number of developers, it's 4.4 million in the U.S. So what we want to do is engage that developer community and help them find paths towards AI so they can, be part, they can participate in that as part of the larger growth story of this entire market. And we want to provide, by, by providing SAS via Workbench, we're giving them, we think, an incredibly efficient um, cloud development environment. It allows them to get in there, choose the language of choice, Python, SAS, and R, right? And you can execute all, any, any language you want, and then you can also fully integrate that into our entire AI and, uh, and analytics lifecycle. And then on the other side, say you've built models, you want to get those into production. Well, I gotta, usually I want to put that to a purpose-built application. So how do we now bring a productivity story to the developer who's got to build an app, right? And that's not a trivial, that's a, that's a pretty significant tech stack. So we, we enable you to automate the entire process of building a React uh, you know, kind of tool chain with uh, TypeScript and a Postgres database and everything on that, and you can bring your model straight into that and get it out into production as fast as possible. Your billion dollar industry investment. You could have said, oh, it's a billion dollar AI investment and just try to ride yeah. the hype, but it shows in, in, in many ways it very much related to, to the AI uh, activity. But I wonder if you could talk about how you're allocating that in terms of you know, industry specificity, uh, societal impacts. How are you guys thinking about that? Well, I'll tackle, I'll tackle some of them, then I'll, I'll pass part, it yeah. off to uh, Reggie for the other side. Uh, first and foremost, I mean, we got to look at it all the way. It's a total value chain conversation. I know it's like business speak, but it is really about that. It's, mm -hmm. what was our go-to-market strategy on it? Uh, what is the, you know, what's the overall um, pre-sales enablement strategy? How do we then take that, tackle that, and bake that down into an overall R&D strategy of technology? And then, obviously, layered in all of that is the part that Reggie uh, really, where is really focused on, which is how do we ensure we do all that in a way that's responsible to the these, to that specific industry, which right. you know is something that you can talk endlessly about. Right. So, so first thing we got to recognize that where we apply our technology. Uh, in every single instance, it's a socio-technical issue, right? So AI gets applied in context, and we can't lose sight of that. So if we've got solutions focused on healthcare, we have to think about it in the context of healthcare. If it's being deployed in financial services, in the context of financial services, and so on. And so where our technology shows up, then we've got to make sure that we're bringing along with it the necessary capabilities within each of those contexts, given the levels of risk that are appropriate within those contexts uh, in the right way. And so that's what our team focuses on to make sure that you know, from a principal perspective yeah. we are showing up you know, people, process, technology, you name it, within those contexts. You know, one of the follow-ups on that is that people want trust and they want to know that their data is protected because you know, in these verticals, in these industries, that's their IP now. That's yeah. intellectual property. Yeah. And so leakage is huge. I think you mentioned that in the keynote. Um, explainability is another one. So yeah. you mentioned supply chain. It feels like we're entering in a new era of data supply chain, security, I, and yeah. management. I it's, mean, there's a whole, I mean, there's so much to unpack in that. Mm -hmm. I mean, I think we're, right now, what we're contemplating is we've been dealing with supply chain disruption from like a, a goods perspective. I think we're dealing with a supply chain disruption from human perspective. Yeah. The skill yeah. sets that are needed to transform right now yeah to tackle this new, this new technology with AI and generative AI, prompt engineering, these are new roles that are, the, the, the amount of new roles and, 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 and um, titles in organizations are changing rapidly and we need to get organizations to scale up quickly. That's why we focus so much on how do we educate people, even internally to companies, on do you understand all these yeah. components of AI because you have to, in order to do this responsibly, you have to be versed in it and, and, and thoughtful about what does it mean at the data level to treat it properly? What does it mean at the modeling level to treat it properly? What happens when you make decisions and you, and you, you don't have an answer, you don't, <laughs> that's not intuitive, and it challenges you. How do you deal with that? Yeah. Reggie, I want to go to you on the, on the creative class that's emerging. Mm -hmm. Humans are so important, augmentation with AI. In fact, we are riffing on the cube in the past. The chess industry has been through this years before. Right. Computers playing against humans, humans and computers playing against humans. Humans plus AI is greater than AI. We've been talking about that on the cube. What is this going to do from a national societal impact? Because we, if this continues, the, the creative energy mm -hmm. that will be unleashed will be unbelievable. Yeah. The new capabilities that will be emerging, 
a new creative class could emerge in the tech scene enabled by AI. What's your, how do you see that? How do you manage the, the dialogue of the guardrails and the doomsday and AI's going <laughs> to, yeah. I mean, there's a lot of conversations around this. Yes. Yeah, there's a ton of conversation around it. It's, it's important to note that there's a ton of hype around it. Yeah. And I think uh, one of the things we want to do is be a little more pragmatic about it. We want to kind of leave the existential doomsday into the world conversation to make it to others. Uh, and focused on, on, the, on the middle of the bell curve, which is where most folks live, right? Uh, we want to, to Brian's point, make sure that we are uh, bringing uh, the performance of productivity and trust to the conversation so that most people can get their business done, get their lives done, et cetera, yeah. et cetera. Uh, now, should we have some conversation about you know, potential existential threats? Sure, right? But we don't need everyone having that conversation. Yeah. Um, so as it relates to industry, we want to make sure that we're on the front side of that industry, to your point about data, we want to make sure that we're having conversations yeah. with folks so they appreciate where their data lives within that overall AI life cycle. And importantly, AI being a life cycle, the yeah. data is the lifeblood of that life cycle. I right? love that. Are you having That's the awesome. hard conversations, I'm sure you are, but what are they like with customers in terms of what roles go away, what roles emerge, how can those existing roles that are going away feed essentially through training or transformation yeah. those emerging roles. What are those conversations like? Well, you know, I think it's important that we don't give way to what we call technocentrism, to suggest <laughs> that you know, technology is always better than human, right? Yeah, there yeah. are some cases where you know, I don't want to yeah. you know, self-serve myself at a restaurant using a QR code as an example. Yeah. I'd much rather talk to a server, tell me a little bit about what the menu offers, right? <laughs> um, so I think we have to be really careful there, and we've been trying to counsel our customers as well as our, you know, our employees on, on how to have those kinds of conversations. We don't have to automate everything. Now, to your point, there will be some conversation that we have to have around displacement and those sorts of things. I think there's a place for us to play from a, uh, as a you know, you know, provider of the technology, but there's also a place for, say, government to play, and we're trying to make sure that our, our platform is flexible and pliable enough to accommodate any of those particular yeah. adjustments that might come from a regulatory and, perspective. And, and I presume you would agree that the, the public policy can't just be there to protect the, the past from the future, mm. you know, but at the same time, you're right, the user experience has to be considered as well. I mean, yeah. you, know, you go to an airport now and you see all these kiosks, yeah, I get it. Is it the best thing for the customer right. experience? Maybe, maybe right. not, but obviously goes I, to the bottom I, line. I think yeah. what's happening is we're being forced to rationalize what does it mean to be human. Yeah. We are, we are yeah. interacting so yeah. much with, yeah. with the, when, it, when the barrier to adoption of this stuff is so yeah. thin or so low, yeah. we're now asking what is our value? And I think yeah. businesses are going to pressure test that, right, in many certain circumstances. And so, you know, and I, one thing we always talk about is like, modeling is studying the past to predict the present or the future. So it does not know about our aspirations. It does not know about our goals, our, mm. our societal values. We have to infuse that into the modeling process. So humans need to be informing the modeling process to where we want to go so that the models help us achieve our goals, not get in the way of our goals. Do you think AI will become, at some point in, in our lifetimes, a, a true learning system? Uh, I mean, it, it's, yeah, I mean, it's doing it now. Yeah, so I mean, measures it is today already. It, it right? is now, I mean, yeah. when, when you're, you, know, you can watch a YouTube video, um, when, 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 a, when a, we can put computer vision on a YouTube video yeah. to watch something run and then bootstrap that into a model that actually creates a dimensional object that can run, that's yeah. it's pretty amazing. Now, it needs to be focused though. I mean, it's, yeah. not, it's not like wide open. It doesn't have the consciousness that we have, yeah. but it certainly can on a per task basis learn, 100%. Yeah. And I think it's a matter of how do we build these integrated systems yeah. that can be, and that kind of comes back to a little bit of the simulation stuff we were yeah. talking yeah. about Yeah, earlier. I mean, I think the human angle is huge. What does it mean to be a human? Also, it changes the UX of yeah. applications. So yeah, right. this comes back full circle to, you know, we've been living in the digital transformation for a decade. Yeah. Now with AI, it just drops in like this with all the goodness. It's going to change things for sure. We know 100%. that. What changes? And what, is, what changes for the customer? And again, to get technical under the hood, a bunch of database, a lot of systems in place, yeah. legacy system, brownfield, greenfields everywhere. There's no free lunch out of that, by the way. That's still there. <laughs> so do you, <laughs> yeah. so we, we there's, there's two strategies. You bolt on AI, yeah. you build an abstraction layer and make it native in the application. Yeah. How do you see that evolving in the systems? Because you're kind of laying out a vision that says, hey, workbench interface into existing yeah. set of systems, a fleet of servers and all kinds of stuff out there, legacy hard stuff. Yeah. You don't want to be taken down and rewiring. Yeah. Yep. And then apps factory to like yeah. make it 
native in applications. Like, yeah. That makes a lot of sense. Yeah, so I, mean, I, I Am think I oversimplifying it, this No, thing? no, that's a great way of simplifying it. Um, I think what we're saying is, for those that are going to be cloud native, AI natives, right? Or if you, I mean, there's the whole concept now of generative AI natives that are being bandied about, right? Yeah. I mean, just throw all the buzzwords out there. Um, <laughs> but the, there's a bunch of, the, the, for the natives that are coming out who are saying, hey, we can start without all that legacy. They're going to be disruptive players in the market and, and you're going to have to deal with that. So it's really important that companies that have legacy infrastructure that have been maybe dragging their feet on moving to the cloud and, and, and dealing with AI, you have to do this because there are going to be folks starting with none of that and they're going to be disruptive businesses that we've seen like some of these other large businesses. So new brands are emerging, you think are going to come out of the woodwork. Yeah, yeah, I think it's going to be, a, an, it's going to be very, very important. In all ways, someone comes up, right? Yeah, 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 but I think in this, it, it, what's happening now, the pace at which something can come up, well, the word disruption is a big deal right now because the rate of change seems so fast that it's disorienting. Yeah. And so it's really, really important that, uh, that basically co companies and leadership think about, all right, how do we protect this business, right, from a place of being disrupted? And that means you got to be fast, you got to be productive, you got to be What's efficient. What's the one thing you'd say to people watching that are kind of sitting there, hey, you know, I've been sitting on the fence. What's different now with AI and foundation models and all this goodness that wasn't available before that they have to move on now? What's the one thing well, I, I that think, they could take advantage? What's the low hanging fruit? Well, I think, well, first of all, the cloud computing paradigm is what, is what has enabled us to ultimately uh, achieve these new outcomes, no question, right? So cloud compute has been a big part of that. But, you know, the paradigm change is just going to be, it's, the, it's the, barrier, the barriers to consuming information is lowering, mm -hmm. and consuming the right information. So it, you have to be thinking about yourself competitively. You are competing on data with the rest of your industry, and whoever unlocks value fast enough to make the best decision the fastest is going to win. That's it. The App Factory really resonated with both John and me. Uh, what is the vision for the, for the App Factory? How does it affect your, your, your TAM? Is it to be the, the, the app store of data apps? Uh, is it something different? Uh, it, it, uh, for us, it, it really, I believe, it expands the total, total addressable market for us greatly. Both Workbench and mm -hmm. App Factory does because, uh, or do I should say, the reason for that is because we believe we're, we're driving efficiencies on both ends of the curve for AI. One is, just getting in, the entry point is lower, easier, and then basically making it real in production is now easier with App Factory. And everything in the middle is kind of the sausage making manufacturing process of, of AI. And we have a great AI lifecycle that is very, very seamless and completely integrated. But now with, with App Factory, we're going to enable people to build purpose built AI driven applications very quickly that is going to be very disruptive out there in the market. And your bookends are, you, you, I think you call the creators or? Uh, uh, the builders of AI and the consumers of AI. Okay, and how does that affect your world? Well, clearly if folks are out building applications, we want them to build them in a trustworthy way, right? Right. So we want to provide a trustworthy platform for people to build responsible AI applications on the top, right? So I want to make sure that as we are building out App Factory, that it's full of apps that folks can rely on. Right, so mm -hmm. if you're building models, we want to be able to assess the health of that model over the course of time. So one of the other things that we showed during that same uh, presentation was the model card, right? Mm -hmm. So this is about us being able to say, you know, here's how you govern and notice the health of the model over time because we recognize that they degrade and so on, right? So I want to make sure that we're building out an application factory that is full of trustworthy applications that developers can feel confident that they can go and grab and utilize with full confidence. And, okay. I, and just, just real quick on that, I mean, Reggie is involved, like integrated into our development process. I mean, he, his team engages with their product, product managers to look at how we're approaching the problem, taking the market perspective of what's expected of us as a company from a responsible innovation perspective and infusing that into the product management requirements set. So it's a very active uh, participation in the technology stack yeah. as well as the uh, governance and, uh, and kind of uh, the ethics side of the house, yeah. of our, he, the, the outreach as well. You guys think a lot about data quality, obviously, <laughs> yes. something that affects you. Yeah. Uh, and, and when you think about things like synthetic data, uh, generation and, and LLMs. Yeah. Uh, we were in the cube uh, with a, a cube, friend of the cube, AI expert, said entropy is winning. <laughs> we got all this randomness, so yeah. are you seeing that? How do you deal with that sort of increasing randomness? Well, one of the things that, uh, what we've done with the, with gener with the, uh, di the um, simulation of data, right, the synthetic data, is that we've actually t taken gener generative adversarial networks and we've extended them, we have a patent for this, to really create exceptionally statistically congruent data that reflects the complexity of the real world. 
this is, we, we were doing this three years ago, by the way, and we were doing this as an internal research project to get this, get this going. And the idea is that because there are times when creating the data, right, or getting access to the data, or actually collecting it or processing it is just not possible. So if we can synthetically generate it, and it's accurate and reflects the real world, we can actually improve data privacy. We can actually deal with a major issue in, in AI, which is rare events. So if you're trying to do like fraud detection, it's a rare event in the corpus of all the data. So as a result of it, like we can create more rare events that then showcases the robustness of the models we create. So synthetic data generation is a huge part of, we believe, is the overall generative AI story because it's going to allow for more robustness of, uh, of the models. And a perfect example of this is no better than autonomous driving. Yeah. The, the, the improvement of AI models should not be a function of how many people get killed on the road from autonomous vehicles. That is unacceptable, mm -hmm. right? If we have the ability, though, to create environments, worlds, that are so similar to the real world, then we build better models and prevent uh, harm. Are you an optimist on that? Can I piggyback on, on, on that for one yeah. quick second? I just want to make sure that folks who are listening imagine this for a second, right? We all probably have loved ones who have dealt with some rare disease or something along those sorts. Well, you know, we work with a lot of the big farmers, and they, you know, many of them use SAS. And one of the things they do in clinical trials is they've got to be able to identify not just physicians who are prepared to take their therapeutics and use them, but also patients within the physician's proximity yeah. who have this rare disease. So imagine being able to use synthetic data to generate the profile of a patient without having to mm. go down to Buenos Aires to go and find yeah. them or to Singapore, yeah. wherever the case might be, right? So just the yes. power of, yeah. of that synthetic data to be able to help us bring ther therapies to market yeah. much more quickly could be potentially huge. Well, the impact is great, but also the trust piece plays beautifully into that. Yeah. I have to ask you, because I know we have done a lot of time, but I want to get it out there. You're doing a lot of work on policy and the company yep. also getting involved with devs, but also on a national level. Yep. What advice do you give companies that are out there trying to have a, a, a framework or a policy without sounding like they're just mailing it in? Yeah. Many are mailing it in, but Right, like, that's a great question. Yeah. Yes. So, um, first thing is start with a set of principles, right? We, we are going to see some regulatory activity throughout the world, right? We see stuff going on in the EU right now, you know, we're having conversations here in the US, there's stuff in Brazil, you name it. Literally all around the world. Um, a lot of that is human-centric, a lot of it is principle-driven, that's great. Um, we like to say, however, that you know, this compliance regulatory environment is the floor, our principles really is the ceiling, right? So yes, we're going to abide by every single law that exists in the areas where we do business, but we want to make sure that in those markets that we're continuing to stay true to who we are, which is again, back to focus on the human centricity, inclusivity, privacy and security, robustness, like that, that's our thing, right? Um, so the first thing I tell companies is, let's start there, right? Yeah. The next step is, how do you bring those principles into practice, right? And that's where a lot of companies are struggling right now. We've done a pretty good job, I believe, in terms of establishing our, our governance regime, if you will. We refer to it as the quads, so we'll focus on matters associated with oversight, the platform that Brian spoke to earlier, we'll focus on making sure that we've got risk controls in place. We're also focused on, importantly, our culture. Mm -hmm. Make sure that all of our people within the company are able to be fluent on matters associated mm -hmm. with trustworthy AI. So we started there, we've done a ton of work there. If folks want a resource, um, one of the places that I would point folks to is the, the US NIST, right? So the National Institute of mm -hmm. Science and Technology uh, released the AI risk management framework. Is it perfect? No. But is it a good set of instructions or a guidepost for where folks can get started to start to actualize and practice some of the principles that we espouse? Yes. So I would encourage folks to go there. If they have some questions, encourage them to look out you know, or, or, or reach out to us. Happy to have those conversations. We were fast followers for some of the others who are already in the space. And now there are a ton more people behind us who are fast following our lead. So we're happy to, to share as much the, as we the can. The hard part of those frameworks is operationalizing and that's yeah, where you yeah. can come in and help. Yeah. What do you want from governments and do you think you'll get it? <laughs> so obviously consistency is important, right? We, we're a global organization, so we want to make sure that there is global consistency, right? So AI as a life cycle is also a huge ecosystem and there are a lot of handoffs between us and other organizations and us and other technology capabilities. So 
you know, I always give the example of electricity, right? We generate roughly, electricity roughly the same way no matter where you go, but here in the US we have a certain uh, uh, plug. If I go to the UK, I need an adapter, right? So there will be some adapters, if you will, that exist uh, as it relates to AI, but to the extent that we can get uh, uniformity and consistency uh, out of these major economic blocks or governments, uh, the better off I think we'll be. Reggie, you're doing great work and, and it's early still, uh, super important. I love you digging into the product as well as the silent impact. Um, Brian, let's end it up with you on this segment. Great keynote across the board, great demos. We didn't give enough justice to the demos. Really highlighted that advantage. For the people watching, what's the most important thing they should take away from the, the, the keynotes this morning? What's the main message? Um, if they didn't watch it, they're going to go watch it. Why should they go watch it? What's, uh, what's the summary of well, the keynote? I think last people, we sometimes have? people think, of, first of all, what people to know is that SaaS is innovating at lightning speed. That's, it's, it, it's a fact. Um, and I think what people to know that we are embracing all the programming languages out there. It's really important that we're not just you know, putting words to this. We're actually, with Workbench, that's a follow through and commitment to saying, we want you to actually be able to leverage Python, R or SAS. Our languages compete like the other languages. But the libraries we're building for Python and R are sometimes 10, 20, 30, 40 times faster than the libraries that are out there in the open source world. So we're adding value to these spaces, right? So I think our commitment to, the, to programming languages and open source is a big, important mark because I want the developers to understand that we are here to help them, help them be productive, go faster, lower their costs, and ultimately help them get AI into production. We want the data scientists and the developers to feel like they can be a hero with our software in their organization. And App Factory is that last mile on top of our AI and analytics life cycle that allows them to take that model they create with our software and deploy it into production for their business and generate returns. More models, more models, more model management. <laughs> it's right. yeah. it, it, AI. Yeah. It's, an, it's, a new, it's a new asset inside the organization that has to be managed. Brian and Reggie, thanks for coming on theCUBE. Really appreciate welcome. your time. Right. We're here live on the show floor here at SAS Explorer. I'm John Furrier. Dave Vellante, digging into all the action here, generative AI and business models, technical models, foundation models, all here on theCUBE. Thanks for watching.